Most of the people who say they're really worried about AI safety just seem to spend their days on Twitter saying they're really worried about AI safety. Why aren't there more Elons? He is sort of this like strange N of one character. This interview is insane. There is so much wisdom in it, yet somehow it barely scratches 50,000 views. That's nothing compared to Sam Altman's most popular interviews. Sam talks about ChatGPT, plugins, Facebook, Google, China, and much, much more. My name is David Andre, and here are the most important takeaways from this overlooked interview. Oh, and the guy interviewing Sam is Patrick Collison, co-founder and CEO of Stripe and one of the youngest billionaires in the world. Takeaway number one, how Sam Altman uses ChatGPT himself. Summarization by far. Mm. I don't know how I would still keep, I wouldn't still keep up with email and Slack without it, but you know, posting a bunch of email or Slack messages into it, hopefully we'll like build some better plugins for this over time, but even doing it the manual way works pretty well. Dude, I can't wait to get access to plugins. Number two, which of the new plugins does Sam Altman actually use? Browsing and the code interpreter once in a while, but honestly, they have not, for me personally, they have not yet kind of like tipped into a daily habit. Now, what does Sam think about data? Will we ever run out of data to train these bigger and bigger AI models? As, as long as you can get to like over the synthetic data event horizon where that the model is smart enough to make good synthetic data, it, I think it should be all right. We will need new techniques for sure. I don't want to like pretend otherwise in any way. Takeaway number four, does it matter what people are doing the training? Does it matter how smart those people are? In the AI community, this is called RLHF, which stands for Reinforcement Learning Human Feedback. Basically, humans manually teaching these AI models what's a good answer and what's a bad one. I think we are getting to the phase where you really do want smart experts giving the feedback in certain areas. So will this create like a crazy um, you know, battle for the smartest grad students? I think so. I don't know how crazy of a battle it'll be because there's like a lot of smart grad students in the world, but smart grad students I think will be very important. How many smart grad students one needs? Like is one enough or do you need like 10,000? It's, we're studying this right now. We, we really don't know. Now, what does Sam Altman think about China? Is China a threat when it comes to AI? There are a lot of people who make incredibly strong statements about what China will or won't do that have like, never been to China, never spoken to an, someone who has worked on diplomacy with China in the past, uh, really kind of know nothing about complex, high stakes international relations. I think it is obviously super hard, but also I think no one wants to destroy the whole world and there is reason to at least try here. Takeaway number six, open source models. How good will they be? Stuff like Open Assistant, Vicuña, Hugging GPT. What role will they play in the AI revolution? I think there's gonna be two thrusts to development here. There will be the hyperscalers, best closed source models, and there will be the progress that the open source community makes and it'll be, you know, a few years behind or whatever, a couple years behind maybe. But I think we're gonna be in a world where there's very capable open source models and people use them for all sorts of things and, 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 and the creative power of the whole community is, is gonna impress all of us. And then there will be the frontier of what people with the giant clusters can do and that will be fairly far ahead and I think that's good because we get more time to figure out how to deal with some of the scarier things. This opinion actually goes directly against the leaked document from Google that recently said that Google has no mode and supposedly that Google is losing its edge to open source models but Sam Altman doesn't seem to think so. Number seven, should Facebook open source Llama? By the way, Llama is Facebook's best AI model and it literally stands for large language model meta AI. Should Facebook open source Llama? At this point, probably. The reason why Patrick asked this question is because back in March, Meta accidentally leaked the Llama model and a lot of people think that the leak wasn't so accidental. So what AI strategy should Facebook adapt? I think Facebook's AI strategy has been like confused at best for some time, but I think they're now getting really serious and they have extremely competent people and I expect a more cohesive strategy from them soon. I think there'll be a surprising new real player here. Personally, I'm kind of excited to see what Zuck comes up with because I feel like a lot of people are heavily underestimating him. Takeaway number nine, what new AI discovery would make Sam Altman more or less afraid of AI potentially ending humanity? Most of the new work between here and super intelligence will move that probability up or down. Okay, um, is there anything you're particularly paying attention to? Any kind of contingent fact you'd love to know? If we could, first of all, I don't think RLHF is the right long-term solution. I don't think we can like rely on that. I think it's helpful. It certainly makes these models easier to use, 
But what you really want is to understand what's happening in the internals of the models. What's crazy is that even the very best AI researchers still have no idea how these massive language models actually work. Just look at what Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, had to say. There is an aspect of this which we call, uh, all of us in the field, call it as a black box. You know, you don't fully understand. You don't fully understand how it works, and yet you've turned it loose on society? This is called interoperability, and it's a very serious problem in the AI community. Now, does Sam Altman think that there is enough work going towards this problem? No. Most of the people who say they're really worried about AI safety just seem to spend their days on Twitter saying they're really worried about AI safety or, you know, any number of other things. There are people who are worried about, very worried about AI safety and doing great technical work there, but we need a lot more of them. We're, we're certainly shifting a lot more effort inside, a lot more like technical people inside OpenAI to work on that. But what the world needs is not more AI safety people who like post on Twitter and write long philosophical diatribes. It needs more people who are like going to do the technical work to make these systems safe and reliably aligned. And I think that's happening. It'll be a combination of people that have that good ML researchers shifting their focus and new people coming into the field. Man, all these Twitter experts just got roasted by Sam Altman. Takeaway number 11. People are spending more and more time talking with AI instead of talking with humans. A thing someone said to me recently that has stuck with them is that they're pretty sure their kids are going to have more AI friends than human friends. I don't know what the consequences are going to be. One thing that I think is important is that we, we, we establish a societal norm soon that you know if you're talking to an AI or a human or sort of like weird AI assisted human situation. But people seem to have a hard time kind of differentiating in their head. Even with the, these very early weak systems like, you know, Replica that you mentioned, it's whatever the circuits in our brain are that crave social interaction seem satisfiable with like, for some people in some cases with an AI friend. So what is Sam's prediction on where AI is headed? Does he think there will be this one AI overlord? I think what we're heading to, which is sort of less scary, but in some senses still as weird, is a society that just has a lot of AIs integrated along with humans. And you know, there have been movies about this for like a long time. Like there's like, you know, C-3PO or whatever you want in Star Wars. Like, people know it's an AI, it's still useful, they still interact with it. It's kind of like cute and person-like, although you, you, you know it's not a person. And in that world where we just have like a lot of AIs that are contributing to the societal infrastructure we all build up together, that feels manageable uh, and, and less scary to me than the sort of single big super intelligence. Takeaway number 13, what is OpenAI's business strategy? I am a believer as a business strategy in platform plus killer app. I think that's like worked for a bunch of businesses over time for good reason. I think the fact that we're doing a consumer product is helping us make our platform much better. And I hope over time that we figure out how to like have the platform make the consumer app much better too. So I think it's like a good cohesive strategy to do them to do them together. Really what we're about, we'd like to be the best research org in the world. And that is more important to us than any productization. And building the org that can make these repeated breakthroughs, uh, they don't all work. You know, we like went, we've gone down some bad paths, but we have figured out more than our fair share of the paradigm shifts. And I think we're have the next big ones will come from here too. And, and that's really kind of what is important to us to build. So research is more important to OpenAI than profit, but I don't think Daddy Microsoft would agree with that. Now, over the years, OpenAI has had all kinds of breakthroughs, but which of them is Sam Altman the most proud of? The whole GPT paradigm, I think. I think that was a kind of thing that, that has been transformative and an important contribution back to the world and comes from the, the multiple kinds of work that OpenAI is, is good at combining. By the way, if you don't know what GPT means, it stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And Transformer is the architecture that Google discovered back in 2017. But what if Sam Altman was the CEO of Google? What would he do differently? I think Google's doing a good job. They have had like quite a lot of focus and intensity recently and are really trying to figure out how they can move to really remake a lot of the company um, for this this new technology. So I've been, I've been I've been impressed. By the way, this interview took place exactly one day before the Google I.O., where Google announced 26 new AI products. So just keep that in mind. Takeaway number 16. Are AI models like ChatGPT actually a threat to search? I suspect that they mean search is going to change in some big ways, but not 
not a threat to the existence of search. So I think it would be like a threat to Google if Google did nothing, but Google is clearly not going to do nothing. Number 17. What non-open AI, AI products does Sam Altman actually use? And his answer is hilarious. I don't use a lot of things. I, I kind of like have a very narrow view of the world, but ChatGPT is the only AI product I use daily. Now, is there an AI product that Sam Altman would like to see? I would like a Copilot-like product that controls my entire computer. Mm -hmm. So they can like look at my Slack and my email and Zoom and iMessages and my like massive to-do list documents and to just like kind of do most of my work. Number 19, and this is an interesting one. Why aren't there more Elon Musks? Is he just one of a kind or can you train people to be like him? I have never met another Elon. I have never met another person that I think I can, can be developed easily into another Elon. He is sort of this like strange N of one character. I'm happy he exists in the world, of course, but you know, also a complex person. I don't know how you get more people like that. Takeaway number 20, how Sam Altman chooses who he works with. But I try to work with people that I've known for like a decade plus at this point. You know, you don't want to only do that. You want some new energy and volatility in the mix, but having a significant proportion of people that you've known for a long time, worked with for a long time, I think that's really valuable. Like in the case of OpenAI, I had known Greg Brockman for a long time. I met Ilya for maybe only like a year before, even a little bit less than we started the company, but spent a lot of time with him together. And that was like a really good combination. I derive like great pleasure from having like working relationships with people over decades through multiple projects. Uh, and like, it's a lot of fun to like, feel like you're building together towards something over that has a very long arc. Now, which of the non AI companies will benefit the most from AI? I think some sort of investing vehicle is going to figure out how to use AI to be like an unbelievable investor and just have a crazy outperformance. So like Rentech with these oh new God. technologies. Yeah. By the way, when they're saying Rentech, they're referring to Renaissance Technologies, which is a hedge fund founded by James Simmons, famous mathematician and Wall Street billionaire. But if he figures this out, he might become a trillionaire. We'll see who gets that title first. Now, obviously, Microsoft is a very close ally to open AI. So how will Microsoft implement AI? I think Microsoft will transform themselves across almost every axis with AI. Now, earlier I explained what RLHF is and how it's used to improve the AI models, but Sam Altman thinks that it also might be hurting them. We don't understand the RLHF process as well, and we may be doing more like brain damage to the model in that than we than we even realize. Takeaway number 24. What's the number one reason limiting the world from being more abundant? There's too much friction and doubt at every stage of the process of idea to like mass deployment in the world. And I think it makes people just try less than they used to or believe less. So where are all the young entrepreneurs? It's it's something has really gone wrong. And there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about what this is, but like where are the great founders in their in their 20s? It's not so obvious. There's, you know, there's definitely some, I hope we'll see a bunch. I hope this was just like a weird accident in history, but maybe something's really gone wrong in our educational system or our society, or just like how we think about companies and what people to aspire to. But I think it is, uh, it is worth significant concern and study. If you learned anything from this video, then please subscribe. It takes two seconds.